ਸਾਂਝਾ ਟੀਵੀ ਦੇ ਸਮੂਹ ਦਰਸ਼ਕਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਪਿਆਰ ਭਰੀ ਨਿਗੀ ਸਤ ਸ਼੍ਰੀ ਅਕਾਲ ਅੱਜ ਕੈਨੇਡਾ ਦੇ ਇਮੀਗ੍ਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਮਿਨਿਸਟਰ ਸੈਨ ਫਰੇਜ਼ਰ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਕਿ ਸਰੀ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਪ੍ਰੈਸ ਕਲੱਬ ਆਫ ਬ੍ਰਿਟਿਸ਼ ਕੋਲੰਬੀਆ ਦਾ ਮੀਟਿੰਗ ਕਰਨ ਆ ਰਹੇ ਨੇ ਤੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਅੱਜ ਵਿਸ਼ੇਸ਼ ਗੱਲਬਾਤ ਹੋਏਗੀ ਆਓ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਕੁਝ ਪਲਾਂ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਲੈ ਕੇ ਚੱਲਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਉਸ ਪ੍ਰੈਸ ਕਲੱਬ ਦੀ ਮੀਟਿੰਗ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਬਕਾਇਦਾ ਪੂਰਾ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਪ੍ਰੈਸ ਕਲੱਬ ਹਾਜ਼ਰ ਹੈ ਤੇ ਗੱਲਬਾਤ ਸੁਣਦੇ ਆ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਸਾਡੇ ਆਏ ਮੁੱਖ ਮਹਿਮਾਨ ਨੇ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਰਣਦੀਪ ਸਰਾਏ ਤੇ ਸੁਖ ਤਾਲੀਵਾਲ ਵੀ ਨਾਲ ਨੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਗੱਲਬਾਤ ਤੇ ਬਾਅਦ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਗੱਲਬਾਤ ਕਰਦੇ ਆ ਮਨਿਸਟਰ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ on behalf of punjabi press club of bc i would like to say thank you to mr shan fraser and uh, mr randeep sri and suktaliwal thank you for your time and i would like to um, request mr taliwal to say a few words and then we can start the and introduce yeah, them introduce them. excellent thank you and uh, good afternoon everyone and sasikal uh, i'm going to be very short and sweet but first of all i want to thank each and every one of you uh, coming together and to Uh, have a conversation with the with the minister when we talk about the minister this is minister uh, first time after um, minister mccallum came to have a press con- oh, okay. uh, conference with the with the south asian or punjabi media uh, punjabi media club and as i sit on the immigration and citizenship committee uh, minister is very accessible when it comes we ask minister to appear on the committee usually these ministers run away but uh, you know minister fraser is, is the one that is always willing to come up and, and 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 come up with the the ideas that he want to listen to the members on the other hand if we look at over the last little while liberal government has done well when it comes to immigration last year we brought in 405000 immigrants and minister has brought in a very comprehensive uh, plan to help the economy grow and uh, i without any further ado minister floor is yours uh, and uh, welcome to sari the best part uh, of course sari center is but sari newton is all is your thing sari is all great yeah, yeah that's right that's right yeah newton um, and yeah Look it, it is uh, it's really great to be back on the west coast. Uh, I'm from uh, Nova Scotia. I spent some time in western Canada, but I I haven't been uh, uh able to travel much the last couple of years and it's just really nice to get to see people uh in person and and I want to say um I uh, thank you to the Punjabi Press Club uh for the invitation and Suk uh, and Randy uh for for arranging. This is um Uh, a tremendous opportunity um just before i get too deep uh l- let me say thank you uh for the work that you do um one of the things that i've noticed since i I've, i've been appointed uh, to be canada's minister of uh, immigration is that a lot of the newcomers i meet um derive immense value uh from the programming that you offer uh, a lot of people uh take a little bit of time after they arrive uh, before they start to uh, rely on sort of mainstream national media to consume their news and the connection that i have uh to share news about immigration policy or the work of the federal government for a lot of newcomer uh communities is from uh local ethnic media outlets and i just um i being somebody who grew up uh, my whole life in nova scotia uh it's not something that i tuned into uh, uh my entire life uh, but now uh so many of the people that i deal with just say how grateful they are for the work that you do to keep them apprised of what's going on sometimes in their country of origin uh, but sometimes important news uh that happens in canada and i just want to pass on on behalf of so many people that i've met since this um uh, appointment last fall uh, how grateful they are and uh, i i as well am, am very grateful for the work that that all of you do um i'm also really grateful for these two guys uh you guys have a couple of rock stars uh sitting beside me right now um there's some things that they've done that have uh, gained a bit of attention i i know your uh, motion with the uh, securitage month and and here we are uh, now uh and, and ran deep with his uh private private members motion to create a uh, permanent pathway for uh people who have a temporary status in Canada. Um these are people who actually do the work and have have the paper uh, trail to prove it. Uh but a lot of the work that I don't think you you see on a day-to-day basis 
uh, is people going to bat for their constituents and people advocating for policy changes that are going to have a meaningful impact, whether it's on the parents and grandparents stream, uh, whether it's on other family reunification models, whether it's on the advocacy to just grow our immigration ambition more generally. Uh, I really, really have a couple of very strong allies uh, with our, our South Asian caucus members, uh, but, but Suk and, and Randeep in particular have been absolute champions for the since the very moment that I met them because we all sort of uh, uh, joined around the same time uh, and got in, involved in politics together. And it's been really, really a, a privilege to, uh, to learn from them uh, about the importance of immigration when we were trying to get it off the ground in Atlanta, Canada, uh, and now to have their expertise to inform my work in this role is, is something I'm very happy for. Um, so look, I, I have a couple of, uh, of thoughts that I want to leave with you guys. Um, the, the first is that uh, immigration is a major, major pillar of our economic growth strategy. Um, I can't express to you how important it is, not just generally, but at this very particular moment in time. Uh, when I look at the challenges facing the economy, we're in uh, completely new territory as we seek to bounce back from this pandemic recession. Um, Canada's economic recovery to date has been amongst the very strongest of any country in the developed world. Uh, with uh, G7 economies, uh, we have um, the most uh, extraordinary jobs recovery and, and rate of growth that, that's ever happened in my lifetime. Uh, we've got 115% of the jobs that were lost during the pandemic have now been recovered. Uh, our GDP has uh, exceeded pre-pandemic levels. Uh, our unemployment rate, as of uh, the jobs numbers that just came out uh, about a week ago, uh, are not just the lowest, uh, is not just the lowest since the beginning of the pandemic, but the lowest since we started keeping track of those statistics in 1976. Literally the lowest unemployment rate on record. Notwithstanding that, if I look back to uh, before the Omicron variant landed in communities across Canada, there was 965,000 job vacancies. We don't have the workers in Canada today to fill all of the jobs that are available. And if we don't fill the jobs that are available, the businesses that are not just supporting newcomers to Canada, but supporting people who've been here for one generation or 10 generations would be at risk as well. Um, we need to embrace immigration if we're going to maximize our economic growth potential. Now, the great news is Canada is hands down winning the race for talent globally, but in my mind, we can win it by a wider margin. And the way we do that is embracing immigration. Um, there's other things we should be doing in the economy as well to foster a culture of investment, to increase uh, uh, innovation in companies, but we can't grow the economy without the people to make our businesses succeed. Um, but it's not just an economic uh, issue that we need to be paying attention to when it comes to immigration. We are on the, um, we're, we're staring down the barrel of our, our really uh, frightening gun here, folks. The demographic trend that we've been witnessing over the course of the last half century in Canada is something that should concern all of us. Uh, I think back to, um, well, I don't think back, this is before my time, I look at the numbers back in the, uh, the 1970s. We had seven workers for every retiree in Canada. Today there's about three. By the time I'm ready to retire on our current trajectory, there's gonna be two. That's really frightening. Uh, it's not just the fact that we won't have the people to support the, uh, the, the services that we depend on. Our needs are going to be greater because the population that we have now is aging. If we don't add more people, more workers, more families to the economy, we're going to be in real trouble when it comes to financing health care, when it comes to building the infrastructure that we need, when it comes to paying for the cost of education for our kids. These are things that everybody cares about. And one of the solutions that we're going to have to embrace if we want to continue to experience the kind of public services that we've come to depend upon is to bring more people into our communities. Now, I feel very fortunate, if I can steal a, uh, a line that uh, Minister McCollum used to use, the Minister of Immigration in Canada has a really unique problem, and that my biggest challenge is that I can't get people here quickly enough. When I talk to some of my counterparts around the world who deal with some really negative attitudes towards people who come from different countries, um, that's not something that I really have to worry about too much here. If somebody pitches uh, one of those uh, xenophobic comments towards me in a crowd, I don't have to say a word because the crowd goes after that person. And it's really, really a wonderful thing about Canada. I think part of it stems from the fact that with the exception of Indigenous communities, uh, every community in Canada came from somewhere else. My ancestors came here about 250 years ago after the Highland Clearances in Scotland. Uh, they were persecuted and they didn't have a place to stay. Uh, they washed uh, up on the shores of rural Nova Scotia and uh, the Frasers that landed there are my direct ancestors. 
Um, I look uh, over the course of our, our nation's history when it comes to our humanitarian tradition of wel welcoming Vietnamese boat people, of more recently Syrian refugees, Afghan refugees, and now Ukrainians who are coming on a temporary basis. I think this is a good thing for our communities. But one of the things that's been really heartwarming for me with all these humanitarian efforts, other newcomer populations have been amongst the most generous to welcome people who are fleeing these kind of humanitarian crises. And I think it's something we should all be very proud of. I do want to address uh, one of the challenges that I'm facing right now. It's not lost on me that there's some uh, really, really difficult times when it comes to people who are uh, trying to come into Canada. Um, Souk mentioned that we set a record last year for the most number of permanent residents that were ever settled. And when you look at the numbers across the system, our immigration system punches way above its weight for our country our size. But the experience of people who go, that, go through that system is immensely frustrating. Uh, one of the things that I've come into when I've been watching the, uh, the impact of COVID-19 on our system is it's really battered uh, the world of immigration in Canada. In fact, it's happened globally, but perhaps uh, to a greater degree in Canada because our ambition is so high. Uh, there's two main ways that uh, the pandemic has really uh, ca caused uh, frustrations in our immigration system. Uh, one, we've had local uh, public health situations in different parts of the world shut down offices. And we don't necessarily have the same capacity to have everybody work from home on a laptop in other places around the world like we did uh, in Ottawa. Uh, the other piece that's really challenging is we made a decision, it was the right thing to do at the time, to pivot our strategy towards welcoming more people who were already in Canada as temporary residents during the pandemic when our borders were closed so we could resettle large numbers of people at permanent residence. But we didn't have an intake control on the number of people who were going to continue to apply because we want it to continue to attract the best and brightest from around the world. But it's created a scenario where we now have a couple years of applicants who are in the queue trying to come into Canada at a time when we uh, are, are still scaling up year over year, but not in a position to overnight just completely double or triple our capacity. Now, the good news is despite these challenges, I'm starting to see the internal numbers are showing that we're turning a really important corner here. Whether it's on uh, the resources we're putting towards uh, temporary programs or whether it's the actual people who are being processed under our permanent programs. So we've made a couple of, uh, a couple of big investments and th there's a few things that uh, we can do to address these things that we're doing right now. But the things that we're seeing right now is that um, in the first uh, few months of uh, th this calendar year, there's been more than 147,000 uh, cases processed on the permanent residency side. Um, we uh, are, are in excess of our, our goal uh, right now. We passed uh, before the end of March uh, 108,000 uh, permanent residents who were landed with a landing inventory of about 100,000 more. Uh, and our goal for the entire year is 432,000. So things are actually starting to, to uh, turn a bit of a corner here. There are still challenges and we're working very hard to change them. And I wanted to give you a snapshot just on some of the very specific things that we've been doing. Uh, I think in my mind, there's really three things you can do uh, to chip away at the, uh, the really serious uh, challenges that we're dealing with processing. Uh, the, the first is resources, the second is technology, the third is creating level spaces. Uh, on the resources side, um, uh, I, I'm pleased to be working with Minister Freeland on this uh, because she believes immigration drives the economy and is willing to put her money where her mouth is. Uh, we started uh, by hiring more than 500 uh, staff just to process more cases. And that's really the number one thing that's causing this uptick in the rate of processing that we've seen over the last number of months. These people have been on long enough that they're now trained and they're producing at a really high capacity. Uh, but we're not stopping with that first big batch of people uh, that, that we've hired. In the economic and fiscal update, we had an investment of $85 million that's going to be making a big difference on work permits, study permits, temporary residency visas, proof of citizenship, uh, and uh, PR cards as well. Uh, in addition, uh, in the recent federal budget, we saw another $385 million that's going to allow us to do some really cool things on the temporary residency visas. Uh, in particular, uh, although that uh, we, we do get funded uh, to some degree each year to make sure we can keep the lights on, um, we've got a permanent funding model uh, as a result of last week's budget that's going to ensure that we can actually hire people that we won't have to replace and retrain every year. This is going to have a long-term impact on our ability to make sure that we're not losing capacity every year when we inevitably ha don't know what's coming down the pipe the next budget. To have some certainty uh, for, for several years ahead uh, is really going to allow us to have a little more predictability and to boost our product productivity. Uh, on the client service side, there's another $187 million uh, to improve the, uh, the ability for people who are going through the application process to get information, to talk to people. Now, 
we are dealing with such uh, a high demand right now that it's not going to fix every problem overnight. Money's not the only thing you can do. Uh, uh, is not the only thing that we need. Uh, we got to make other changes too if we're going to make a permanent fix to Canada's immigration system. The second bucket uh, that we need to address is we need to upgrade our technology. Uh, I look right now, uh, it, honestly my jaw hit the floor when I was appointed to this position and I realized the extent to which Canada's uh, system of immigration is still paper-based. Um, we are doing everything we can to accelerate the transition to a modernized digital platform. There's a couple features that have already come online. We've got different uh, lines of business where you can actually get, uh, for family re reunification for example, as of February, you can actually go on and check out your case status with a, a permanent residency case tracker. We're going to be rolling that out along all the different lines of business that we have as soon as the tech is ready to go, but we didn't want to delay one uh, just to wait for everything else to come online. We're going to, by this summer, have digital application capacity across 17 different lines of business in, uh, in our immigration process. Um, we're trying to look at every, every single aspect of it, and to the extent we can allow a person to access it on a laptop or their phone or at their office, it's going to not only make it a better user experience, it's going to reduce the capacity on the system. I look right now the calls that we get from uh, MP offices and uh, that came through uh, MP's offices to the minister's office. In the past year, I think there was over 230,000 requests just coming from MPs. 80% of those are for status updates for people who are wondering where their application is. If we can put that information in the applicant's pocket, we're going to be able to reduce up to 80% of the calls that come into our system and free up those resources to process more cases. It's everything's interconnected and if we can continue to look at it in a holistic way and adopt the technological change that will empower people to get information about their cases, to navigate the process on their own, it's going to free up the resources we have to process people faster. The final chapter of things that we're working on right now is our immigration levels plan. I was absolutely thrilled, uh, it's a couple of months ago now, to table what was the most ambitious immigration plan that was ever tabled in the House of Commons in Canada's history. This year, uh, we're looking at increasing from 405,000 to 432,000 people to be resettled as permanent residents, growing up in the years ahead. Uh, my sense is we're going to continue to need to revise that to go upward and upward and upward uh, because of the need that our economy has for more people to fill jobs and the appetite the communities have to welcome more people. As long as we have the processing capacity and our communities have the absorptive capacity to resettle people successfully, uh, I, I'm not worried right now. I think immigration is a wonderful thing. Uh, I'll maybe leave you with a, a little anecdote from my own experience. And I've got a very different need for immigration in rural Nova Scotia uh, than you guys have here in British Columbia. Um, but I've seen it transform my community for the better. Um, I grew up in a place that's uh, notoriously uh, and, and exceedingly friendly. Um, I don't know that we were always as welcoming as we could have been. Um, I look back uh, to the controversies during my first campaign in 2015, and we had a local elementary school closed down, and we lost the mental health unit in our major regional hospital. Um, a big part of why this was the case is we had a lot of young people leaving because there wasn't a lot of economic opportunity at the time in rural Nova Scotia. Um, we made a decision as a region, uh, the federal government was a part of it, provincial governments in Atlanta, Canada were a part of it, and communities were a big part of it, to say immigration is going to help uh, correct this demographic problem with our young people leaving, create more opportunities for folks. Uh, what we've seen since we've embraced immigration is not just that newcomers are coming to our community, uh, but they've opened up new businesses that have created job opportunities for people. They've uh, made uh, our communities more dynamic places to live, offering new services in town. And we're seeing a lot of young families like mine who've moved back to the area to take part in a revival of the communities where we grew up in. And right now the problems that we, we face are more similar to the ones in bigger cities across Canada. Uh, we're, we're wondering if we can build houses quickly enough for all the people that are coming in. Uh, and I can tell you, as a local member of Parliament, it is a much better problem to have to be worried about having to put houses up quickly enough because so many people are coming than losing schools and hospitals because so many people are leaving. Um, I, I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to make a big difference to help communities not just like mine but communities like the one we're in now uh, to make sure that we do more and more to welcome newcomers into Canada. Uh, it's our honestly held belief as a government that this is a big part of the right path forward and it's going to set up for success as we seek to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I'll leave my comments there and, and gladly hand it over to, uh, to our moderator for, uh, to take uh, questions the crowd may have. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
for us. Uh, you said there are three criteria that we are bringing people from Afghanistan. Do we have those criteria, uh, same kind of, when we got refugees from Syria or from uh, recently Ukraine or another country, whenever there are the chaos? Uh, there is a main problem why uh, six have to sponsor, even it's not yet clear, why they have to sponsor those families when other people are coming here from other country, they are not being sponsored. They are accept, you are accepting, our government is accepting them as refugees. Why not people from Afghanistan directly? Uh, so th there are many, many people who are being, uh, uh, who are government-assisted refugees from Afghanistan, yeah. uh, and uh, it's a, it's a mix in both in Syria. There was a mix of government-assisted and privately sponsored. In Afghanistan, there's a mix of government-assisted and privately sponsored. One of the reasons you might see uh, a greater degree in Afghanistan of government-assisted refugees, and, and in fact, there are there are more uh, in Afghanistan that are government-assisted compared to Syria. Uh, one of the reasons is the people who um, uh, qualify on the basis of the fact that they, they served alongside the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, there was a decision taken, it was before I was in this position, though I think it was the right thing to do, uh, to say um, we, we can't count on a private sponsor to, uh, to take the people who've served uh, Canada. They, because when you privately sponsor a refugee, you, uh, depending on which program you take them through, you get some say in who you bring. Um, when we wanted to make sure that the, the people who worked as interpreters, for example, are resettled in Canada, we didn't want to leave that to chance for a private sponsorship because we made a commitment to them on the basis of their service that we would resettle them. But in both Syria and Afghanistan, there was a mix of private sponsorship and government-assisted refugees. Uh, Ukraine is a different program altogether, uh, and we had to invent a new program for unique circumstances. Uh, my first reaction when I learned of the possibility of this massive exodus of people westward from Ukraine uh, was to think about whether we could stand up a refugee resettlement program. But in order to deal with the kind of numbers that we were starting to see, it might have been a, a five-year type uh, program. A and we didn't have that kind of time. Uh, but we also were dealing with a group of people who don't want to, by and large, move to Canada permanently. Uh, people who've left Syria uh, and fled after the, the Civil War broke out, uh, people who've uh, fled Afghanistan, it's very sad, uh, but I met with um, a group of Afghan refugees yesterday in Halifax, and um, they know that they're not going to be able to go home. And it's heartbreaking. Uh, in Ukraine, they are very hopeful that when this war is over, they're going to be able to go home. In fact, some people are, are returning already, and that's a personal decision they're making. Uh, so it's not a typical refugee program. But the federal government is providing a much smaller amount of support to Ukrainians who are coming than people who are resettled as refugees permanently. Uh, we have a six, and look, it's a really unique and generous program for uh, a new temporary protection model with six weeks of income support. Uh, there will be some charters, but a lot of people are paying their own way over. Some groups are informally sponsoring people to come over. Uh, but this is something that was invented over a course of weeks. It's not a pre-existing tool to deal with a conflict years after it happened. Uh, so there's different reasons uh, that they, the programs look a bit differently, but they're each tailored to meet the unique needs of those specific programs. Uh, but on the Afghanistan versus Syria question, uh, th they are both a mix of private sponsorship and government-assisted programs. Thank you. Uh, second one, with that one. Is there any way a lot of uh, new arriving people, oh, thank you. they are being allowed by the immigration consultant, just like you were saying, LMIA program or other program. Mm -hmm. Because if there is a fixed, uh, just like government fees, that okay, you can take only that much, not more than that, that's easy for everybody to apply for LMIA or any other programs. Immigration consultants are robbing the new arrival, up to $50,000 to get permanent here. Are you going to take any action? Um, so first, let, uh, let's be careful not to paint all immigration consultants with the same no, brush. They're, some, they're, of some of them are very, yeah. very good, and, and there are some bad actors. But I, just to, to any immigration consultants watching, uh, I want to be careful to say that uh, they, yeah. they don't all meet that, that uh, characterization. 
Um, we did actually a few months ago establish uh, the College for Immigration Consultants, which is going to be a self-regulating body uh, that will uh, be able to monitor the prevention. And I'm a lawyer by trade, and and uh, we have a self-regulating body. Uh, They're government regulated body. We changed. That yeah. Oh, so, sorry. Government. Yeah. No. My, my, my apologies. Yeah. Sorry. I'm I'm uh, I'm yeah. saying, but uh, a professional regulating body. Yeah. Um, to make sure that there is oversight, uh, that, that people are meeting a certain standard. Um, that's only half the battle, though, uh, because there are still issues with people who provide effectively similar services, but in another country, to people who are applying to come. And that's a much more difficult uh, problem for us to address. Uh, the reason that it's more difficult uh, is that we don't have the jurisdiction to regulate what a person in another country is able to say or do. So we have to use uh, our ability to give reliable information uh, to people whenever they apply. Uh, so our message, and we work with uh, local authorities, we work with local offices around the world to say, you need to get information from the government of Canada if you're going to be able to rely on it. But we still do see people uh, being taken advantage of. Uh, you see it with, you mentioned LMIAs, we do see some really heartbreaking stories with international students in particular, uh, where people um, don't necessarily care about the well-being of the client as long as they can make money and disappear. Um, it is, uh, I do think that the, uh, the, the college that we've established in Canada is going to allow us to, to better protect against that kind of abuse for uh, people who practice in this space here. Uh, but we need to really continue to work with a local presence in, in countries around the world to give reliable information to people because we don't have that, that uh, hammer to, uh, to, to come down in a strong way against someone outside of our jurisdiction. Thank you. Um, I have a similar question, but okay. it's for the caregiver. So caregiver, caregivers are waiting for their status result since 2019, 2020, and 21. Their work permits are, are expired and their health cards are also expired. So what should they do further for surviving? So why only caregiver program has no processing time limit? Um, so the, the long answer is we established a pilot program that said we were going to process 6,000 people last year and the spaces went like this. Uh, and and we, we met our goal. And now that we've got a pilot that's demonstrated enormous demand, we have to do some uh, some thinking on how we can transition that, uh, learn lessons as to what, what's successful with it, how are people doing, uh, to figure out what the long-term solution is going to be. Um, it's a, a, always a challenging thing when you have a pilot that's really popular uh, because uh, I, I'm thinking in the back of my head, that's a good sign that we could be doing it again or, or doing doing more of it. Um, on the flip side, uh, one of the challenges that I see is I'm also dealing with um, a, a pie I'm trying to grow every year to the extent that I can get more funding to grow and grow and grow the total number of people. Uh, but for every uh, space that you, uh, you have for somebody to be, uh, to be resettled as a, uh, as a PR, um, that, that's a space that has to come out of another stream until you're able to, to grow that pie and build out the processing capacity. And that, uh, because if you increase spaces without increasing processing capacity, you have longer backlogs. Uh, and that's not a consequence that anybody wants either. Um, I, I'd point out though as well that it's the caregiver's pilot is, is not the only way that caregivers can come to Canada under our different immigration streams. Uh, we have uh, in Atlantic Canada the Atlantic Immigration Program. Uh, we have the provincial nominee programs that come in. We've had the caregiver pilot. Um, we're also uh, right now looking at different opportunities to um, make certain changes to the express entry system and this would I want to be careful not to promise something specific uh, on caregivers on this until uh, we, we have the details uh, but just one thing that I think is going to be really helpful with a change that we're pursuing with respect to express entry is um, the system's really good at bringing in people who are very qualified to do different jobs it's not particularly good at identifying gaps in the uh, Canadian economy and bringing people in to fill those gaps. So you might have two people that each have a PhD. One of them will be in a very in-demand sector. The other will be in a sector where there are, is no demand. They're treated equally under yeah. the express entry system. Uh, what I've seen through this pandemic, and it's really changed my own thinking, I, I get very offended when I hear people use high-skilled versus low-skilled. Uh, what we've seen over the course of this pandemic, a lot of those low-skilled people mm -hmm. are essential workers, and our economy would collapse without them. I'm thinking healthcare providers, truckers, uh, you all know as well as I do uh, some of these groups. Uh, the changes if we make the express entry system more flexible, 
will allow me or whoever succeeds me in this position to actually identify what are the key gaps in the Canadian economy that we need to fill. And we would have the ability to say, well, maybe it's going to be caregivers in British Columbia, maybe it's going to be truck drivers in Nova Scotia. Uh, and we would be able to say, okay, let's do a draw on truck drivers from Nova Scotia and caregivers from British Columbia. And if we have that flexibility, we're going to have a much more efficient immigration system uh, because we'll actually be targeting the needs of the communities more effectively. Uh, so that, that's something that we're working on right now. Yeah, because um, I'm sorry, I have um, a very small question also. On uh, behalf of Hope Save Us Society, my society working so hard for last few years, and we already signed one petition, and Mr. Sri know that as well, and Mr. Sukhtaliwal. And right now we sign up another petition, E3955, uh, supporting the Motion 44 bill, the one Mr. Sri uh, working on it. So a lot of people, undocumented people, always we have that issue we discussed with mm -hmm. Mr. Sri. Don't you think government should give them an open work permit so they can build their status here? Um, yes, I'll, although my answer is a little bit more nuanced than that. Um, I think there's things that we need to do to, to make it easier for people who are here, who've been working here, who have families here for a, for a long time, uh, to cre get, give them some certainty to allow them to take part uh, in the uh, legitimate economy, not the underground economy. Um, we've had some real success with a pilot program we ran with the um, uh, construction sector in, in Toronto. Uh, and I think it's really showed us the potential to uh, bring people out of the shadows who are making really positive contributions to their communities, uh, not just in their work, not just in their family life, but volunteering at nonprofits, uh, making a really, really important difference. Um, we don't have a full uh, picture of the, the scale uh, of the number of people who are undocumented and making a contribution in Canada. And, and we've also got other people that we don't want to, we don't want to create a draw to bring people here who uh, come in contrary to the rules. Uh, but developing the, the policy in the right way that will allow us to um, give access to, uh, legitimate access to our economy to people who've been accessing it in an illegitimate way, if that makes sense, uh, in many instances for many years, is something that I, th I think we should be pursuing. Um, we have to do the policy work to make sure we get it right, uh, to make sure we create the right pathways for people. Every time you dig in, you start to see 18 new issues about if you do it this way, you create more problems. Uh, if you do it that way, maybe you can make a, a positive difference. Uh, but, but to answer your question, uh, the results of that pilot have showed me that there's real potential to do a lot of good, uh, to give people a legitimate status who've been here and who've been working but uh, are, are not officially documented. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, so, one of the things to consider? Yeah. Uh, for a number of years, like living from 10 years, they can get uh, kind of the, Well, the, these are the very concerns that we, we yeah. think on right now. Yeah. So sure. So, on behalf of uh, so can I, uh, as members of Parliament and the Punjabi Press Club, I want to uh, thank you, uh, Minister Fraser, uh, for coming out here. Just to let you know, the, the Press Club here, uh, within uh, probably 24 to 48 hours, uh, uh, 500,000 plus people will know you came here and answered <laughs> questions. Uh, and that's on every platform, just so you know. They're in print format, they're in radio here today, they're in uh, television, and they're also in digital. Uh, so oh, their cool. social media platforms are also very vibrant and uh, uh, half a million people plus in this uh, neck of the woods get their information daily from them and they'll know all the questions you asked and were asked and what were answered. So uh, this is a medium uh, that you should always stay connected with uh, if you want to get your message uh, through to the to the people on the ground here, especially here in Surrey. So on behalf of them, I want to really thank you. And thank uh, you. if you thank can stay you for a few much. minutes, yeah. I think uh, they just yeah. want to get some bites yeah. from you. Okay. But thank, thank you to all uh, of you. Thank you so much. And yeah, thank you. You're so much. ਪੀ ਪ੍ਰੈਸ ਕਲੱਬ ਆਫ ਬ੍ਰਿਟਿਸ਼ ਕੋਲੰਬੀਆ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਹੋਈਆਂ ਖੁੱਲੀਆਂ ਵਿਚਾਰਾਂ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਦੇ ਸਵਾਲਾਂ ਦੇ ਜਵਾਬ ਬੜੇ ਵਧੀਆ ਤਰੀਕੇ ਨਾਲ ਇਮੀਗ੍ਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਮੰਤਰੀ ਨੇ ਦਿੱਤੇ ਨੇ ਤੇ ਆਓ ਫਿਰ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਗੱਲਬਾਤ ਕਰਦੇ ਆਂ ਇੱਕ ਹੋਰ ਸਵਾਲ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਪੁੱਛਦੇ ਆਂ ਥੈਂਕਸ ਫॉर ਕਮਿੰਗ ਹੀਅਰ ਇਟਸ ਅ ਪਲੇਜਰ ਐਂਡ देयर इज अ क्वेश्चन एक्चुअली लॉट ऑफ पीपल आर आस्किंग दे आर वर्किंग फॉर मोर देन 10 इयर्स 15 इयर्स ऑन टेंपरेरी वर्क परमिट इज देयर दैट बिल 44 इज गोइंग टू हेल्प दोस पीपल they left uh, schools they cannot qualify for ielts is there any way that they can get that off from ielts and get a pr 
Um, so you, you've got two distinct issues here. Yeah. Uh, so first, I want to give a huge credit to my colleague uh, Randeep Sarai for tabling uh, Motion 44. Yeah. Uh, this is also a mandate letter commitment for people who've been here working on a temporary status, uh, seemingly on a permanent basis. Okay. Uh, I do think we need to establish a pathway to permanent residency. We have a little bit of uh, policy work to do to establish exactly that, what that's going to look like, okay. so we can provide a clear line of sight to give those people a, a real chance to get here. Uh, I do want to be a little bit careful on some of the language testing because there's uh, certain rules in place for very good reasons uh, to make sure that people are protected in the workplace, they can defend themselves and seek help where that's necessary, hmm. uh, but to the extent we can uh, do more to welcome people who've proven that they've been able to get along in Canada over a, a significant number uh, period of time, uh, I think we need to do more to make it easier for those people to obtain permanent residency. They already get proved because they're working for 15 years with the same work permit when they're doing before, so why not... Uh without eyelid test? Well, I think this is one of the uh, the things that we have to look at when we develop the policy on establishing that pathway to permanent residency. And I don't want to prejudge the outcome of a policy development process that we're in the middle of right now. Okay. Uh, but we're, uh, we're specifically looking at ways to make it easier for those people to get permanent residency as we speak. Thanks a lot. Uh, Thank real you. pleasure. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I hope that Sanja TV has been a great pleasure for you today. I hope that you have a great pleasure for this video. क्योंकि वार वार साडे मन के सवाल उठते हैं इमीग्रेसन बाबत पर अज जी कोई गलबात है पंजाबी प्रेस क्लब ऑफ ब्रिटिश कोलंबिया की हरेक व्यक्ति का हरेक वर्ग का सवाल उन्होंने तो पूछा गया उम्मीद है कि यहोजे प्रोग्राम तो जरूर लाह लाओगे धनबाद थोड़ा प्रोग्राम देखने दे मैं कुलदीप सिंह सजा टीवी तो मेरे न कैमरामैन ने रोबी जी धनवाद